Welcome to the Chapter 6 pre-lecture video. Today we're going to be learning about correlations. In our everyday lives, we're able to recognize these associations between variables that we see all the time. For instance, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to tell you that the taller you are, the more you're going to weigh, the more you tend to weigh. Or the more money you make, the bigger your house is going to be, right? These are just innate associations that we automatically are able to make because we recognize them so easily on a daily basis. So I want everyone here to recognize that these are called correlations and they're very important to statistics. In the two examples I just gave you, they were both positive correlations. And the first thing you need to know about correlations is that they can either be positive or negative. So correlations can either be positive or negative. So let's start out with an example. Two, uh, an association that we should be able to make. Uh, and we might even be able to put this together in survey data. Let's see what we think of it. So if I asked the STAT 100 class for the number of hours they spent studying before an exam, the hours they spend in the library dut dutifully studying, and I also asked them for their exam score, what do you think is going to be this correlation between What's the association between these two variables? How are they related? Do you think that the more we tend to study, the better we're going to do on the exam, or the worse we're going to do? Better. I agree. So the more we study, the better we're going to do. This is a classic example of a positive correlation. The two variables increase together. As one increases, the other tends to increase. That's a classic positive correlation. Well, let's look at another example. What if I had swapped out, instead of the hours you spend studying at the library, the hours you spend partying the night before? So now we're going to say the hours spent partying. And we're going to correlate that with your exam score. All right, so again, as we, the more hours that we spend partying the night before a big exam, do you think the better we're going to do or the worse we're going to do on that exam? Worse. Worse. I would say that's a pretty clear trend, and maybe it's because I wrote it in red, but we're able to see that this is a negative correlation. That as one variable is increasing, the more that we tend to party, the lower our exam scores drop. So as one variable gets larger, the other variable gets smaller, and we see this downward slide, right? The more we party, the worse our score can, tends to do. So this is a prime example that we can either have a positive correlation or we can have a negative correlation. Now my next question for you is if I tell you I had a big exam this morning and last night I spent six hours partying. Here I am, six hours, let's say. Can you tell me exactly what my exam score was? No. No. You might be able to say, wow, Jackie, you really, you really were being stupid. Why did you go out partying? Your exam score is going to be low. But how low? Is a low a C, or is it a D, or is it an A minus? I mean, who knows, right? Every person is different. So that is why I want everyone to recognize what these scatter plots really are. We ask you for, uh, to answer these surveys all the time uh, on the, for bonus points, right? And on these surveys, we'll ask you your first question, and then we'll ask you a second question. So, you know, when we filled out on uh, survey one, we asked you for both your height and we asked you for your weight and crooked. Um, so let's say, for instance, I'm going to answer the survey. Okay, here I am. I am five, nine and a half. Okay, there's my height and my weight is confidential. And I'm going to plot myself right here on the graph, right? There is my dot. From that dot, you're able to see my height and my weight. Well, and then let's have you fill out the survey. And then there's your survey answer. And then you fill out the survey your survey answer and then you fill it out and then we have all the STAT 100 students fill it out and each dot this is the takeaway point each dot represents an actual person a data point is not just some kind of imaginary object these are reflecting actual responses that were given by actual people so then what would happens is we start to see as more dots are placed on our scatter plot we start to see a trend develop right and the trend is not this perfect little line that I drew the first time, right? We see almost like a football shape. But the, the trend of these dots is definitely increasing, right? It's going upward. That the, the taller people are, 
the more they tend to weigh. So that's what the scatter plot is, and that's what I mean when these things are correlated. So it's important to recognize that these are actual people. And it's also important to recognize that different variables may be correlated with different strengths. Height and weight, sure, that one is correlated, but there are lots of exceptions to the rule, right? I mean, the basketball players are freakishly tall, no offense to the basketball players in the audience, but they are probably tend to weigh less than you would expect from someone who's almost seven feet tall, right? So our basketball players, you know, might be down here. And then there might be some people, you know, like um, wrestlers. Wrestlers tend to be shorter, but they also tend to pack on a lot of muscle mass. So wrestlers are probably going to weigh more than we would expect based on their height. So there are so many exceptions to the rule that these, as these correlations might, uh, may vary in how strong they are. So, and just like I said before, you weren't able to perfectly predict my exam score based on how many party hours I had. That's because the correlation wasn't quite strong enough. And what do I mean by that? How can we measure how strong or weak a correlation is? Well, let's think about it. So now, how do we measure this strength of correlation? The way that we measure the strength of a correlation is through something called the correlation coefficient. And the correlation coefficient is denoted as a little r. That's going to be our best friend for the next couple lectures, r. The things that we need to know about r is that r is a numerical value that can range all the way from negative 1 to positive 1. And what's in the middle of those? 0. So it's going to be either perfect negative 1, perfect positive 1, or some kind of decimal in between. And so what does this mean? What is a correlation of negative 1? Well, we can tell that the correlations that are going to have a negative in front of the decimal are going to be these negative correlations. And correlations that have a positive in front of the decimal are going to be positive correlations. And how close they are to either extreme is telling us how predictable these correlations are. So we would call a correlation where the uh, R value is exactly 1, positive 1. We would call that a perfect correlation. So let's look at an example of a perfect positive correlation. In America, we weigh, we weigh ourselves in pounds. And in the UK, they weigh themselves in kilograms. So let's look at the correlation between uh, weights in pounds and weights in kilograms. Well, as our weight increases in pounds, surely our weight is also going to increase in kilograms. That makes sense. But now if I tell you my exact weight in pounds, would you be able to give me my exact weight in kilograms? Yes, because this is a basic formula. Right? where we can take my weight in pounds, throw it into a calculator, complete the formula, and it will pop out perfectly my weight in kilograms. It's just a conversion, right? This is a simple formula. If you know one variable, you know the other variable exactly. So we're going to see this perfect correlation where every single dot, every single data point lines up perfectly on the line. There's no wiggle room, there's no wondering. If you know one variable, you know the other. So all the data points are perfectly on that line. And the way that we really measure R is by how tightly these dots hug the line. So if they're hugging the line so tightly that they're right on top of it, that means that R is equal to perfectly 1. And because it's positive, because it's going in that upward direction, they increase together like we had discussed before. Well, let's look at the other extreme. Let's look at negative 1. Uh, this is also considered a perfect negative correlation now. So let's think about um, in a 24-hour day, let's think about the hours that you spend awake, the hours that you spend awake, and let's correlate that with the hours that you spend asleep. So let's think about it intuitively first. Uh, the more that we're awake, do you think that we spend more time or less time asleep? Less. Less time asleep. You can do one or the other. You really can't do both. So the more time you spend awake, the less time you spend asleep. Now, if I tell you that within this 24-hour span, I was awake for 20 hours, I spent a lot of time awake, would you be able to tell me how many hours I slept in that, in that period? Yes. Yes, if I was awake for 20, that means I had to have slept for 4, because what else am I going to be doing for those other 4 hours? If you're not awake, you've got to be asleep. 
So we're going to see, uh, you know, on the other end, say that I um, say that I slept for 15 hours, something crazy like that. You'd be able to tell me perfectly how many hours that I spent asleep. So we see this line going downward because it's negative. The more we're awake, the less we're asleep. And once again, every single data point is going to line up on the line because it's this basic formula. You know, you can think about it in mathematical language, you know, that the hours you spend awake plus the hours you spend asleep must equal 24 hours, right? So if we plug in the hours we were awake, um, we, you know, with our 24 hours, it'll pop out how many hours we were asleep. It's a formula. You know one, you automatically know the other. There's no variability, no wiggle room. That you know one, you know the other. Hope I'm pounding that point home. So let's think about what would be in the center then. I talked about positive one, we talked about negative one. What about a zero correlation? A zero correlation is one where the two variables may as well be random. They have nothing to do to get with each other. They're totally unrelated. There's no correlation between them. So let's think about um, my height versus the number of pets we own. If I tell you my height, do you, are you given any idea how many pets I own? Does it help you out at all? No. no, right? The two variables have nothing to do with each other, right? There's no relationship. So knowing one piece of information is basically useless for figuring out the other piece of information. The two variables are completely unrelated. So what we see in situations like this is the data, tends, the data points tend to be scattered about with no discernible pattern that it almost looks like a big blob thrown right on the, on the page. It's not going upwards, it's not going downwards, there's no uh, discernible trend. So we often see you know, the line just going straight through the averages and you get no real slope at all. So those are two variables that have nothing to do with each other. We say that that is considered R equals zero, unrelated. Yes? Um, when you say the line going right through the middle, do you mean like no matter what your height is, that would you just predict the average number of pets? Is that what you mean? Right, exactly. That, that's actually a very good point. That you'll see that no matter what the height is, the way I've drawn the line right now, no matter what my height is, when I say that I just draw a line through the center, I draw a line through the average number of pets. So let's say the average number of pets people own is 1.5, something like that. It's probably low, lower than that maybe. So let's say that I know that the average height is over here and I know that the average number of pets is over here. If you tell me your, if I tell you my height, there's no reason you would guess above average for the number of pets or below average for the number of pets. Your safest bet would be just to guess the average. It's the one piece of information we do know. So we see that this line goes through the average of the, of the data points, the average for the variable that is unknown. And I didn't draw it as beautifully here and I'm sure you'll see it on the projection in lecture, but with the one you don't know, your best guess, when there's no correlation, there's no association between the two variables, your best guess is going to be the average. So these are the three extreme examples, but not everything lines up just this way. There is such a thing as having, you know, a 0 0.5, a negative 0 0.5 correlation, or a positive 0.5 correlation, or anywhere in between. So let's think about those less than perfect examples. So now let's revisit examples that are less than perfect. The first thing we talked about was your exam score being correlated to how many hours you spent studying. So we already knew that this was going to be a positive correlation. We see that students who tend to study more tend to have higher grades on the exam. But if I tell you one, are you able to give me the other like we were with a linear formula? If I tell you how many hours I studied, would you be able to tell me exactly my exam score? No, we had already decided that. So we see this positive trend. We know it's positive, but R is, so R has got to be somewhere between zero and positive one. And how close it is to one is determined by how tightly it hugs the, the, the data points hug the line. So in this case, there's a definite discernible trend, right? The data points seem to be going up in an upward direction. And what would, what would you think um, the correlation would be here? One was where they were all on the line. 
zero was when there was no pattern around the line. What do you think this one would be, if you had to guess, between zero and positive one? Just a, just a shot in the dark, what would you think? R equals, my guess would be positive. 0.5. I was going to guess 0.5 or 0.6. So let's say, in this example, let's say it was 0.55, right? So then this is definitely not scientific, this is all very hand-drawn. But we see that the dots are going in an upward direction, which means it's a positive correlation. They're close to the line in a, you know, a specific trend, but there is a lot of wiggle room, right? There are, like, look at, look at right here. Let's look at this little screenshot of science that I've made for you right here. Two, uh, these students all, part, all studied for the same amount of time. But we see some students didn't do very well, and some students aced it, right? There's variability within each one. So just knowing how many study hours you have is not enough to perfectly predict your exam score. So now let's look at the opposite here, where we look at party hours instead. Just the same idea that we're not able to perfectly predict, but we do know that the more you tend to party, the less well you do on your exam. So we see these data points in a downward fashion and they're kind of hugging the line, but kind of not. There's some variability. So in the same way, we see that this is not a perfect correlation, but it is negative. So I'd predict this one, what do you think? Does it look about the same or a little bit tighter or a little farther? A little tighter, maybe? I would say a little tighter. So what I guess we predict maybe this is R equals point negative point four nine, something like that. Well, tighter wouldn't be that that made oh, negative point. Good job. Very good job. That was an error on my part. The, the tighter they are to the line, the closer they are going to be to these perfect extremes, right? So if they're tighter to the line, that means it's going to be probably R equals 6, 0. 0.60. Excellent point. Thanks for catching me. So the tighter the dots hug the line, just to reiterate, the tighter the dots are to the line, the closer we are to these extremes, this negative one or this perfect positive one. And the farther they are, the more spread out, the closer they are to zero. So this last point is arguably the most important of the whole section. And it is going to combine everything we've learned up until this point. And the great question is, does correlation mean causation? Are those two words identical and interchangeable? Well, to investigate that, let's look at this case a little bit closer. I found an interesting statistic online that said that uh, ice cream sales are positively correlated with drownings. So I put together you know, a fake little scatter plot showing different years where uh, the, you know, how, how fast ice cream is flying off the shelves versus how many drownings there are. And now, Non-STAT 100 students are going to look at this and wonder, wow, is ice cream the silent killer of America that's <laughs> drowning Americans, right? We see that the more we sell ice cream, the more people are drowning. So that, but now STAT 100 students are going to step back and wonder a little bit more. So the point of this scatter plot seems to be the main message that non-STAT 100 students are going to get away from this is that ice cream is leading to drownings. So back to chapter one, you know, maybe we could try to think of some causal links, like maybe people who uh, are enjoying a nice big bowl of ice cream jump into the water and get a side cramp and drown, right? We could maybe try and think of some causal links. But remember, confounders, right? That was a long time ago, but I hope we haven't forgotten. Let's try and think of some outside mystery variable that is correlated, that's associated with both ice cream sales and the relative drowning rates. So what do we think? We know that ice cream sales and drowning rates are correlated, but does that necessarily mean that ice cream rates or ice cream sales are causing these drownings? What else could be here in this mystery box? What do we think? When are people buying the most ice cream? Let me ask you that. Just think off the top of your head. When, when are you craving ice cream the most? On a January summer. night? No, summer, exactly, thank you. On a hot summer day, right? That's when people head to the ice cream shop. 
And when are people most likely to hit the local pool or the local lake? In summer. middle of January? No, summer! <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Exactly. So, and probably, on a, okay, now when we're looking at summer, are you more likely to go swimming when it's, uh, you know, 78 and sunny or when it's 92 and sunny? You know, when, when your AC is broken, the only way to relieve yourself from the heat is through swimming, right? So not only the seasons, but also probably the relative temperature for the season. So let's think. Let's throw in our confounder box. Hot summers. Now when the summers are hot, people hit the ice cream stores. And when the summers are hot, there are more swimmers in the lakes and in the pools. And just mathematically, the more swimmers you have, the more likely it is you're going to have more drownings, right? So would you conclude, based on this scatter plot, that ice cream is causing drownings? No. 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 Right? We're able to see that there is another variable involved. That sure, they're correlated. But correlation and causation are not the same thing. Causation is much different. Any questions on this? So that's a confounder? Hot, hot summers is a confounder? Hot summers is this hidden confounder, making it look like these two could possibly uh, have some kind of causation between them, right? But the only thing we know for sure is that they're correlated. And the more logical explanation is this confounder here that is taking these two associated variables and making them look way more closely related than they actually are. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Any questions on that? So I'm sure you're going to be much more skeptical when you read the newspapers now and understand that correlation and causation are not the same thing. And you'd be surprised at how many newscasters and newspaper uh, writers don't fully understand that. So uh, enjoy lecture and have a good week.